Pia Shandell Sotham has had quite a life. A North Shore girl, she graduated from Delbrook in 1964 and went on to 11 years of professional theater in Vancouver. She spent five years at CKVU as co-host of The Vancouver Show. It was a wild time for audience and hosts. She married her producer, Harvey Sotham, and eventually left CKVU and the media spotlight and entered private life. You actually made a living from the stage for 12 years. Am I correct here? Well, yes. you call that a living. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it, was, it was meager pickings, but, uh, you know, I loved it. I was uh, passionate about it, as every young person should be about something. And for me, it was uh, acting. And in fact, it is for my son now. You know, I, I lament to see it happen, but he's very talented. But um, I worked in, in all, well, really in all the professional theaters in Vancouver over that period of time and uh, loved it. It was wonderful. But you know, Terry, when I, I left it deliberately, I didn't, it wasn't accidental. I really felt that I had come up against my limitations. And I sort of had a little chat with myself at, at about age 28, I think, and I said, yeah, I said, I don't think you're really going to be one of the greats. And uh, that was a devastating sort of admission to myself at the time. I don't know why I got to that point, uh, but that was very strongly how I felt about it. And I, I kind of was in the stage where I was getting a lot of parts of intense, troubled yes. females, and it was driving me crazy. I thought, you know, this isn't really true. I didn't believe in it anymore. I wasn't enjoying it. And I couldn't make those characters make sense to me. So I said, get out, do something else. In the mid-70s, Pia appeared in the movie Shadow of the Hawk, directed by Daryl Duke. When Daryl opened the doors at CKVU, he knew exactly who he should cast as the Vancouver show's co-host. It was our girl, Pia. I asked her about the most memorable moment. Uh, most memorable has got to be Terry Fox. Yeah. He was kind enough to let me into his hospital room with his mom and dad and his friends. You know, I would, there was press everywhere, and I just thought that was incredible. And then, you know, I just, I didn't bother him. I let him be for a bit. And then he granted me an interview, you know, one of the last that he ever did. And, uh, oh, you know, that was really incredible. Asked him about how he felt about dying. Yeah. A lot of viewers got angry with me for that. I had a lot of reaction to that. that how, how could you ask him about death, you know? And, and I thought, you know, how could I not? And uh, Terry said afterward it was the best interview he'd ever done. Terry Fox is uh, somebody who tried his hardest. And, and even though I died of cancer, um, my spirit didn't die, and I, and I kept trying. Tell me about the road you traveled when you married into society family. Well, it, it was quite a transition. Um, I blithely entered it. Uh, you know, just assuming all would go well, and in fact it did. But it was, it, I had to learn a sort of a whole new set of rules, a whole new way of relating and so on. Not personally within the marriage so much, it's just sort of taking on a position of uh, the wife of the scion of a well-known Vancouver family. And what about your pals on the other side of the street? Well, some of them, um, of course, endure to this day and are still my best pals, and others kind of didn't go for it, you know, and uh, I was a little disappointed in the reaction of some people who couldn't, who wouldn't allow me to make my necessary adjustments in order for me to survive in my real life. I feel now, I turned 40 this year, and I feel that, that I'm kind of embarking on a new era in my life, uh, and I'm excited about it. I, I may not have as much, uh, you know, on the ball in terms of energy or, or happenings as I have had perhaps at other times, but I feel competent, I feel capable, I feel thoughtful, I feel skillful, I feel uh, still sensitive, I feel full of love, I feel full of good fortune, and is capable of working hard. And, uh, you know, I have patience now. For example, I mean, I could, you know, be doing more, but then I think, well, wait till, wait till your little girls are a bit older. They need to do, they need more of your time, and, and things don't worry me the way they used to. So, you know, better than ever, I think. Better than ever. Pia continues to write both for Equity Magazine and V Magazine, where she is also associate editor. Her biggest career move, however, then continues to be as a wife and a mom. In the early 1960s, folky Tom Northcott was a household name, not only in his native Vancouver, but in many U.S. cities as well. Tom began writing and singing folk music at Prince of Wales High School in Vancouver. He was a fixture on local TV, in the folk music clubs, and he even ran his own recording studio for a while. 
Everyone thought he was on the verge of becoming a big star, but Tom decided that wasn't what he wanted. I asked if he remembered the first time he performed in public. About 1958, there was a talent contest coming up. Um, well, I knew I had talent, but I didn't know what I was going to do. I borrowed a guitar from a friend of mine named Steve Nickel, who was a Harmony. It was uh, one of these $40 guitars. It was a pretty good guitar at the time. Learned three chords, sang Bye Bye Love, and um, If You Don't Know, I Ain't Gonna Tell You, George Hamilton the fourth first hit. And um, there I was. You did some television, too. What did you do in uh, television here? I started uh, television with the Let's Go shows called Music Hop in uh, at least five centers. Halifax and Anne Murray being on the other side, us uh, and the Let's Go show being here. My record was released um, about in the same week that Sgt. Pepper's came out. And I remember being in San Francisco <laughs> in this place, you know, it's a crash pad. You meet some people <laughs> and you end up staying there. And my record was released in within 24 hours. I mean, first of all, I'm listening to Sgt. Pepper. I said, wow, first time I've heard this. Blown away. And then uh, two days later, uh, I'm, in hearing, I'm hearing my record all over San Francisco, and I find out that within 24 hours, number one request song in San Francisco. Within about uh, three weeks, number one record in San Francisco. And I think, you know, am I God or what? You know, <laughs> have I arrived? I mean, if, I mean, if you're already number one in the number one city, in the number one, you know, the absolute center of the universe at that time, I mean, how can anything happen except everything else should fall in place? Is there any, I mean, would it ever occur to me that Chicago wouldn't fall into line? That El Los Angeles wouldn't fall in line? Well, they didn't. They didn't. And, then, and, and so that was the, probably the, one of the highest points of my career, and then one of the greatest letdowns when the record didn't take off worldwide. I think it was because in about 69, I bought a boat and went fishing. That was the end of my uh, performing career as such. So how long did you fish? 14 years, 1969 to 1983. Then sold the, uh, my final vessel, started law school. Uh, I actually went to UBC for a little while, then law school. And I've been practicing since uh, September of last year. What kind of law are you doing? I do fisheries law, marine, admiralty, that sort of thing. If I had to do it all over again, what would you do different? I, I think one of the reasons that I focused um, passionately on my artistic life is because I didn't have a good um, relationship life. I didn't have a full emotional life. And that's something that, uh, that I am addressing now. And, and that's probably the new frontier for me is um, the frontier of the heart and the emotion and, and that sort of thing.